Sometimes I think about how history gets constructed. I know, what a nerd. But it fascinates me, because history is not a series of facts, neatly stacked in a chain of cause and effect. No, for every fact, every date, every statistic, there's a story that hitches a ride, an interpretation that shifts depending on your vantage point. Let me give you an example. It's a fact that six million Jews were murdered during the Holocaust. But attached to that fact is an ugly interpretation that lingered for decades. Here it is. The Nazis managed to kill six million because the Jews did not resist. They went like sheep to the slaughter. It's a tough thing to hear and a tougher thing to say, but is it true? Did Jews really go to their deaths without protest or resistance? And where did the interpretation of Jews as meek and pliable even come from? The answer might surprise you, and it might just change the way you view the Holocaust. European Jewish history doesn't start or end with the Nazis. Jews have been living in Europe for more than 2,000 years. European Jews were scholars and poets, philosophers and physicians, merchants and diplomats, but they were also a tiny minority on a frequently hostile continent. Decade after decade, region by region, they suffered expulsions, inquisitions, pogroms, blood libels. 2,000 years of this had made it very clear that nothing, not scholarly achievements or professional skills or even proximity to the folks in charge, could insulate Jews from persecution. So over the centuries, the Jewish community developed a two-step survival strategy. Step one, bribery. When trouble was afoot, and it often was, the community would first try to bribe the threat. But if the bribe wasn't enough, it was time for step two, run. This system had worked with varying levels of success for hundreds of years. Then the Nazis showed up and they were a new kind of enemy. They wanted the Jews gone not just from their country, but from history, stripped for parts and thrown away. So why didn't the Jews activate step two? Why didn't they flee like they had so many times before? I have to warn you, this answer is a bummer. Many tried to flee, but there was nowhere to go. All around them, doors were slamming, borders were tightening. The Nazis spread through Europe like a shadow. Very few countries wanted boatloads of Jewish refugees, and the lucky few who managed to make it out were a tiny fraction of Europe's nine million Jews. Nine million people all marked for death. It didn't matter if you were a scientist at the top of your field, a world-renowned musician, or a glittering socialite. The Nazis wanted every Jew permanently erased. I know what you're thinking. The Nazis came to power in 1933. Almost immediately, they set up a propaganda machine that infected all of German culture with blatant and alarming anti-Semitism. Why did it take so long for the Jews to realize what the Nazis were doing? Why didn't they flee earlier before countries started falling and borders started closing? It's a fair question. But before we answer it, remember, hindsight is 2020. It's easy for us, 80 years later, to look at the propaganda, the ghettos, the Nuremberg laws, and say, we know where this is going, but they didn't know then. Not really, not the whole plan. And that was by design. The Nazis employed almost laughably bloodless euphemisms to cloak their intentions. The annihilation of global Jewry became the final solution. Mass murder was special treatment. Who could have known that resettlement in the East was a one-way ticket to an extermination camp? The lies continued, even at the gates of hell, as the Nazis led the sick, the young, the old, the pregnant to their disinfecting shower. A shower with no soap, no water, only death. Was that why so many Jews were murdered? Could six million people really have been lured to their deaths by a handful of euphemisms and lies? Of course not. The lies and cunning language were just one piece of a much larger picture. Because as you'll see in a second, the Nazis had another method for keeping people in their place. From the beginning, there were resistors, Jews and non-Jews, who refused to go down without a fight. But these resistors paid dearly for their bravery. And so did everyone else. 
because the Nazis reserved a particularly cruel punishment for anyone who dared to defy them. Think about this. You're fighting a force that's taken over your home, that has confined you to a ghetto and deported your family members and shot your friends in front of you. You know you probably won't survive against their tanks and guns and trained dogs. You might not even survive the disease and starvation ravaging the ghettos and camps, but you choose to fight. You wanna die knowing you've taken a couple of them with you. So you smuggle a pistol from somewhere. You shoot a Nazi officer in the head, and in revenge, the Nazis murder 200 Jews. It's not just you they're coming for, it's grandmas and babies and rabbis and parents and students, people who had nothing to do with your choice to shoot an officer, people who pay for your act of defiance with their lives. That's the calculus of collective punishment. But the spark burned bright because Jewish history is full of warriors. Think of Joshua calling down the walls of Jericho, King David as skilled with a sword as he was with a lyre, the prophetess Deborah who led 10,000 men into battle, the Maccabees, Bar Kokhba, men and women who became legends, their names etched forever into Jewish history. And now, new names, new warriors, new legends of Jewish bravery and resilience, like Abba Kovner, who had warned the Jews in 1941, let us not be led like sheep to the slaughterhouse. It is right we are weak and without defense, but the only answer to the enemy is resistance. When the Nazis liquidated the Vilna ghetto, Kovner led a partisan revolt, and his resistance continued after the war as he worked to smuggle Jews into the land of Israel despite draconian immigration restrictions. Eventually, Kovner made it to Israel where he lived until his death in 1987. But not every hero lived to see the future they fought for. Mordechai Anilevich was only 22 when the Nazis began deporting Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto. But he was a natural leader, commanding the Jewish Fighting Organization, or the ZOB, in Polish. In January of 1943, the ZOB interrupted a deportation and killed 50 Germans. It was an unbelievable victory. But the Nazis came back to the Warsaw Ghetto on the first night of Passover, 1943. And this time they had tanks. The ZOB was outnumbered and outgunned, but they refused to give in. Not when the Nazis set fire to every house in the ghetto. Not when they gassed an entire bunker, killing Anna Levitz and a hundred others. Not until May 16, 1943, the liquidation of the ghetto. Four weeks. The Warsaw Ghetto fighters held out for four weeks. A starving, outgunned, barely trained force rising up against the Nazi war machine. Theirs was the war cry of the Maccabees echoing across the millennia. Or, as Anilevich put it in his last letter, my life's dream has come true. Armed Jewish resistance and revenge have become deeds. But there were so many ways to resist, and no story illustrates that as poignantly as that of the Bielski brothers. Tuvia, Asile, Zush, and Aaron Bielski were the only ones left after the Nazis murdered their family. They fought the enemy from deep inside the Belarusian forests, blowing up rail beds, sabotaging trains, reminding snitches and collaborators that Jewish blood was not cheap. But they did something else too. Something even more incredible and brave. And you need to hear this because it's unreal. In the most remote, inaccessible part of the forest, the Bielskis established a Jewish community, a haven for the stream of refugees desperate for safety. At its height, this hidden community in the forest supported over 12 Hundred partisans. It boasted workshops, a synagogue, a school. A school. Imagine that. Imagine opening a school as millions of Jews are being slaughtered, as the Nazi war machine flattens entire communities, refusing to stop until every single Jew has been erased. As doors are closing and people are starving and there is no reason to keep hope alive. Who in their right mind would open a school under these circumstances? And this is where we get to the heart of the matter, because this right here is what I think we don't talk about enough. This is the reason that I can't stand to hear anyone say that the Jews went quietly. Opening a school in the Belarusian forests was the ultimate act of defiance. 
Because to open a school, to educate the next generation, is to believe there is a future. And if you believe there is a future, then you're already defying the Nazis. You're not going quietly. You're not going at all. Because you know the war is going to end. The Nazis are going to be defeated. And at the end of that, there will be another generation of Jewish children, and another, and another. And that is the only valid interpretation of whether or not the Jews resisted. In a world that wants you dead, every breath is an act of resistance. Every whispered prayer, every scribbled poem, every stolen moment of joy is a refusal to give in. All over Europe, Jews resisted as they scribbled poetry in the ghettos, as they snapped clandestine photos with illegal cameras, as they operated lending libraries and theaters and orphanages within the Warsaw Ghetto, as they buried their testimonies in the ground, silent witnesses waiting for their chance to testify. The Nazis outlawed Jewish ritual observance in the ghettos and the camps, hoping to crush morale, to break spirits, to sever the connection between a Jew and his history. It was dangerous to study, to pray, to blow a shofar, or perform a Jewish marriage, or hold a circumcision. And yet, even in the most squalid conditions, Jews showed up to confront and embrace God in equal measure. Hundreds of women attended a brief Yom Kippur service on September 26, 1944. They had no food for a festive pre-fast meal. Their holiday dresses were tattered rags. Their synagogue was a filthy barracks in a corner of Auschwitz-Birkenau, with two kapos guarding the door. They had only 10 minutes to recite the Kol Nidre prayer. 10 minutes to observe the holiest, most solemn day on the Jewish calendar. 10 minutes that could have cost them their lives and still they sent up their wild cry to the heavens. This was the face of the Jewish resistance. Because if there is anything you remember about the Holocaust, let it be this. Sometimes resistance is smuggled weapons, warriors making a doomed final stand, defiant words that echo through history. And sometimes resistance is the next breath, the prayer you say on pain of death, the hope you nurture despite all attempts to starve it. The fact that you survived. How did survivors go on after enduring the unimaginable? After losing everything, their families, their friends, their freedom? I don't have an answer for that, except for this. I think that there was one thing they didn't lose, and that was their identities. Hundreds of years of culture had been destroyed, entire yeshivas annihilated. But this is the crazy part. These same yeshivas were rebuilt, transplanted into safer soil. The Mir Yeshiva, reborn in Brooklyn and Jerusalem. The Chabad Lubavitch movement, brought to America. And what bigger act of resistance could there be than the creation of a Jewish state? The unification of Jews from every corner of the earth, safe and self-determining at last. Resistance didn't stop after the war. It continued with illegal immigration to the land of Israel, with the fight to build a Jewish state, and with the continuation of that Jewish state for over 70 years. The grandchildren of survivors are now soldiers defending their homeland, their nation, their people, and honoring their grandparents' memories. Because the Jewish people have always chosen life, we have persisted despite the Assyrians and Babylonians and Seleucids and Romans. And so we gathered every scrap of faith and courage we had left after the most systematized genocide in history. And we chose life. Between 1946 and 1948, the birth rate in Europe's displaced persons camps was the highest in the world. Each Jewish marriage, each Jewish child, a living act of resistance, a triumphant shout that Am Yisrael Chai, the Jewish people still live.